I titled this morning's message, A Victorious Faith. And as you can see by our title slide here, we're going to be closing out Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Um, and uh, while you go there, I want to just mention a few things here in that so far in this chapter, we've seen the writer of Hebrews give us several examples of what faith is, what it does, what it looks like. And he began all the way in the beginning to creation. And, you know, we talked about, talked about um, Abel and, you know, some of, the, some of the patriarchs. And then Abraham and his sons and Moses. And so now we see here that he will give us some more examples, but he will close it all out by just mentioning some really amazing, beautiful, important things about faith. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on. It's just on these last few verses of Hebrews chapter 11. And I, as I mentioned the past few times we were together, I wanted to take this chapter slowly um, because there's just so much here. And I hope that after we're done here, you'll also be able to go home and discover uh, some new and amazing things here. Um, you know, my time is limited, and so um, I feel like I can only just cover a lot of just the surface stuff. But uh, before I begin reading the first part of our passage, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, I we ask that you continue to bless this time, Lord, just as you've blessed every single week. Speak to every person that's here, Lord. Speak to them personally, Lord. Um, get rid of all distractions. I also pray for those watching and listening that you will also speak to them powerfully, that you will transform lives and relationships, Lord. You will show them who your, who your son is and how much you love them and what you did for them and, and they can receive total forgiveness. Show them what really true faith is. So we continue to bless this time, Lord, as we worship you, as we sit before your feet and hear your word. We thank you. We adore you. We glorify you. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 30, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, the word of God says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after being marched around by the Israelites for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. And I'll stop there because I want to mention a few things about just those two verses. In verse 30, the writer moves us from the Exodus to the Battle of Jericho, which is found in the Old Testament book of Joshua, chapter 6. Now, the whole story is found between verses 2 and 6 of Joshua, but the main battle is found in chapter 6. For those unfamiliar with the story, the walled city of Jericho was the first military objective in the conquest of Canaan. Now, most of the Israelites had probably never seen such an ominous city protected by its solid walls, tightly sealed gates, and it's mighty men of war. Logically, it would, have, it would have to take a more superior force to destroy and conquer such an impregnable fortress like that. But what we learn in the story is that faith's methods are different. See, God uses strategies that appear foolish to men to accomplish his purposes. In this particular instance, he spoke to Moses' successor, Joshua, 
and informed him of what he needed to do to take the city. And here's what he said, here's what the Lord said to Joshua in Joshua chapter 6, verses 2 to 5. See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and fighting men. March around the city once with all the, with all the mar- armed men. Do this for six days. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. And so after passing this information down, Joshua and the people did exactly what the Lord told them to do. And sure enough, on the seventh day, the walls of Jericho fell down. Now from a human perspective, those instructions would have sounded and seemed like an an embarrassing, foolish prank. Is God really serious? Is he pulling our leg? But Israel, as a corporate body, believed. Why? Why did they believe? For a couple of reasons. First of all, you got to understand, prior to this, they had just experienced a miracle of epic proportions. They watched the Jordan River dry up when the ark penetrated its boundary. And as a result of that, it made them more receptive to faith. And the other reason was the faith and character that they saw in Joshua. His ironclad certitude of God's word and what he said was stronger than any man-made wall. And seeing that in him was what energized, was what motivated the people. Thus, you see, Israel really did believe they really did believe that God was going to give them Jericho. So when the writer of Hebrews says in verse 30 that by faith the walls of Jericho fell, he means that the Israelites actually did have faith. It wasn't a pretend or a watered-down kind of faith. It was a genuine faith. Let me break that down just a little bit more. At Jericho, the people of Israel had a daring faith. There was no turning back. Having already crossed the River Jordan at, the, at, at flood stage, which cut off really any line of retreat. At Jericho, the people of Israel had an obedient faith. They didn't really understand what God was doing, yet they obeyed nonetheless. At Jericho, the people of Israel had a patient faith. You see, even though the walls didn't fall down for the first six days, they kept marching as God commanded. And lastly, at Jericho, the people of Israel had an anticipating faith. They knew that God would act on the seventh day When they shouted, they knew that. They had no doubt. So you see, their faith pleased God because they believed that, as verse 6 says of this chapter, He exists and rewards those who seek Him. So what can we as believers learn from verse 30? Well, there are a lot of things here, but... Let me just point out an important one. A life of faith is evidenced by a life of obedience to God's word. Even when it seems absurd. Even when it seems ridiculous and silly. 
Paul's comments in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4 are appropriate here. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. And so to an unbelieving mind, the Christian weapons appear not only impotent, but ridiculous. Whoever stormed a walled city wearing truth for his war belt, righteousness for a breastplate, the good news for shoes, faith for a shield, salvation for a helmet, the Bible for a sword? Come on. You can't seriously go into battle with this kind of armor. That's what a person of the world would say. But God gives us directions in His Word and on how to meet our Jerichos. Instructions that are silly, ridiculous to human logic. For example, a man is filling out his income tax form and realizes that if he lists his extra hidden income, it will put a higher tax bracket. It will put him in a higher tax bracket and he will not have any money to pay his taxes. He's up against a dark wall indeed. He has a choice to make, to do what is logical, just like everyone else does, or be absurdly truthful, trusting God to take care of him. Another example, a student is doing poorly in class. She needs a B to get into grad school, and as she works on her final exam, she realizes that it just isn't going to happen. But she notices right next to her, that overachieving A student is uh, using a cheat sheet. And she's reading all the answers and copying them down and no one is paying attention. No one is seeing her. What What should she do? If she truly trusts God, that God's in control, then she'd continue to do her best on the exam not worrying about that A student and trusting God to work out things as he sees fit. And now let's say you've been wronged by an enemy. Maybe not an enemy, maybe it's someone that you just don't like and can't stand. And now you have a chance to get back at them without being found out. Yeah, you can justify it. And others may even applaud you if they knew that you did it. But then, as you contemplate it, you remember the words of Jesus. So you remember the words uh, that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. You've heard it said, You've heard that it it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So now, will you join in the fool's parade and actually pray for the blessing on the one who has wronged you? I was talking to someone earlier and they were telling me that, you know, how hard it, it, it was or has been, has been to, you know, pray for family members who are just, have been giving them a hard time for just believing in Christ, for being a Christian and not, you know, not part of their traditional family religion. And it's difficult. It's hard. I know. I grew up in the same kind of same kind of way I my family was all Catholic and when I came to believe when I gave my life to the Lord my mom initially thought I was joining a cult but as time went on you know I I basically became the black sheep of the family but I accepted it I still love them I still love my family I will still do 
anything for them. If they wanted something from me, I'll do my best to get it for them. But, but I know that my reward, my faith in Christ is what matters the most. And I will continue to walk in Him, with Him, in Him, and He in me, and no one will be able to get in the way except, of course, myself, my pride, my sin. But, again, there is going to be some persecution, whether it's from family, from friends, from somebody, just because of what you believe and who you believe in. But that's part of this walk. If you aren't experiencing some kind of persecution, then maybe you're not being bold enough. Maybe you're hiding too much. Maybe you're hiding your faith too much. Maybe you're one of those closeted Christians that's just too afraid to come out because you don't want to be canceled. You don't want to, you don't want to be found out. But again, it's okay. It's okay to share your belief, your faith. It's okay to share your testimony. What's not okay is arguing about it, fighting about it. Can't imagine the Lord looking to happy face as two people are arguing and fighting amongst each other, and one of them is supposed to be his child. What kind of witness is that? you got to be careful, again, when it comes to those things. But if you've been wronged, the Lord has told us, the Lord has told you to pray, to pray for your enemies, pray, pray for blessings. Pray that they come to know the Lord. If they don't know the Lord already. Here's the thing, church. The scriptures reveal this vital spiritual law. Disobedience reveals our unbelief. But obedience to God evidences our faith. When difficult circumstances confront you, unbelief draws from the arsenals of the world, whereas faith will cause you to take up the armor of God and join the absurd, absurd march around Jericho. So, let me ask you, church, let me ask those that are watching, listening, are you facing any Jerichos today? Are you wavering between God's way and the world's way of meeting it? Do you believe God's word? Ask yourself those important questions. Back in our passage, you then see in verse 31 that the writer now takes us from Jericho to the story of Rahab, which at first, it seems like a dramatic shift in context, in context, in content, I'm sorry. Until this point, the author has identified people we naturally assume would be set forth as examples of faith. Rahab, however, isn't a name that we expect to find on this illustrious list that we've seen so far in this chapter. A prostitute isn't one typically described as faithful to God, but still... The Lord puts Rahab forward as an example to emulate, as an example to look to as a, as a copy, to copy. So how exactly did she trust God? And why was her faith commendable despite her occupation? Well, Joshua chapter 2 says that Rahab hid Israel's spies and informed them how they could escape. As a result, chapter 6 says that Rahab and her entire household were spared. If you read the story carefully, you'll see that she wasn't motivated by courage, self-protection, or some political calculation. 
She was motivated by faith. Rahab trusted in God, in the God of Israel, not only to fulfill his promise to his people, but that he was able to protect her from the destruction of Jericho. In a time of danger, she identified herself with the people of Yahweh and believed in his promises, even though she wasn't an Israelite. So you see, even though she was the most unlikely person to put her faith in God, she believed nevertheless. As a result, she was saved by grace. By this, I mean that although the other inhabitants of the city were marked out for death, God in his mercy and grace permitted Rahab to live. So not only was she saved by grace, but she was also saved by faith. See, according to Joshua chapter 2, she knew that Jehovah had delivered Israel from Egypt and had defeated the other nations during Israel's wilderness wanderings. She understood it, she heard about it, and she believed it. She wasn't like, oh, I've got to find out the, all the facts about that, and there must be some reasonable explanation. No, she believed it. She believed that God had done all those things. Now, for a lot of unsaved people who like to give excuses for not trusting in Christ, for not believing in him, the story of Rahab really is a strong rebuke. You see, some will use the excuse, I don't know very much about the Bible. I'm not a strong uh, theologian. But guess what? Neither was Rahab. She knew very little spiritual truth, but she acted on what she did know. Another excuse is, I've done too many bad things. I have too many sins on my ledger to be, sa to be saved. I'm a terrible, horrible person. God will never forgive me. But guess what? Rahab was a condemned, non-Jewish prostitute. And still another excuse is, what will my family think? But her story tells us that her first concern was saving her family, not opposing them. And so as you can see, Rahab's story shows that there really isn't any excuse. And now, thousands of years after the fact, because of her faith, she stands as one of the great women of faith in the Bible. What an amazing story we have here. Someone least likely to believe. Someone least likely to be saved to be rescued by God. She was one of those undesirables, one of those outcasts, one of those people that was just, no one wanted to be around except in the dark corners of the city. And yet she believed. She had that spark in her heart. And God saved her. He delivered her and eventually, yeah, her family. So don't think that your sins are worse than hers. You could be a serial murderer and he would still forgive you. You could think, oh, the Lord won't love me. He won't forgive me. He won't care for me because I'm in a homosexual relationship. Or 
I've changed my sex. I'm no longer a male or a, I, I, I'm, I'm no longer that. And he'll never forgive me. Well, let me tell you something. He will. For those of you struggling with that, with those things, I will tell you, he will forgive you. And he will give you a new life. And he will show you what it is that he wants you to do and who he wants you to become. Trust him first. Walk with him first. Don't worry about all those other things, all those problems. Just walk with him first, one step at a time, one day at a time. He loves you and cares for you. You can become his child no matter what kind of background, no matter what you've done. And there is room in his kingdom for you. All right, let's go back to our passage here as I read the rest of this chapter. Again, I'm in Hebrews chapter 11, and I'll be picking up in verse 32. And what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, Jephthah um, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength and weakness, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Other people were tor tortured, not accepting release so that they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. Here in this final section of this chapter, the author briefly lists other characters as final examples of faith. But even though some of them aren't as well known as the others that we've already covered, the central message intended is still the same. All of them, all these people that we just mentioned, were marked by astonishing faith. An astonishing faith in God and guess what? It should be the same with us. It should be the same with you. Now, were they perfect examples? No, they weren't. Again, for example, Gideon demanded signs from God and led Israel to sin when he made an ephod. Samson was sexually promiscuous and broke his covenant with God. Jephthah vowed to sacrifice his own daughter, David committed adultery with a woman and tried to cover it up by arranging the death of her husband. But the thing is, the thing here is that the author doesn't remember them for their flaws. He commends them for their faith. Even though they sinned, their lives were ultimately marked by their faith in God, which the author highlights there in verses 33 and 34. They failed, yet accomplished each of these feats by faith. So they serve as examples of a remarkable trust in God. Then in verses 35 through 38, the author then shifts our attention to those who suffer for the sake of Christ by faith. Now, he first mentions some women. Now, he could have been talking about some of the New Testament women who 
who receive their children back from the dead. But also, he's probably also talking about or referencing the work of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17 and the work of Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 4. There in those two Old Testament stories, those women trusted God and they received back their dead. Those who experienced the terrible suffering the author details didn't fail in their faith. Even in the midst of their persecution, they believed God wouldn't fail them. They believed God wouldn't fail to give them the promised land and trusted he would raise them to life one day on the last day. Though they were counted righteous by their faith, they were despised by the world for their devotion to God. The world was not worthy of them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to also keep in mind here what the author is saying. He isn't calling us to die like they died, but he is calling us to trust in the covenant, in the covenant Lord like they did, even if it means a suffering death like theirs. Justin Martyr, an early church father, echoed the same kind of faith when beholding the very place where he and his congregation would be martyred, Justin said this, remember, brothers and sisters, they can kill us, but they can't hurt us. This, my brother and sister in Christ, is the kind of devotion that marked these Old Testament saints. And it's the same kind of devotion that we should display in our own lives. See, faith enables us to turn from the approval of the world and seek only the approval of God. If God is glorified by delivering his people, he will do it. If he sees fit to be glorified by not delivering his people, then he will do that. But we must never conclude that the absence of deliverance means a lack of faith on the part of God's children. And also remember that faith looks to the future for that where the greatest rewards are found. Let me repeat that. Remember that faith looks forward to the future for that is where the greatest rewards are found. The people named in this chapter and even those unnamed didn't receive the promises, but they had God's witness to their faith that one day they would be rewarded. And it's here, and it's here in verses 39 and 40 that the author takes his readers back to the beginning, namely the theme that's found in verse 2 of this chapter. See, even... The saints, those saints had a preliminary glimpse, had preliminary glimpses of God's wondrous fulfillment of his promises. They didn't live to see the coronation of King Jesus on the cross, on the cross of Calvary. And still, they're commended for their extraordinary faith in God's promise. They didn't receive the ultimate fulfillment of that promise, but they recognized that they would experience it when all of God's promises had been fulfilled at the end of time. Their faith, like those the author discussed or talked about earlier, was a future-looking faith. As Christians, and as a matter of fact, every Christian today ought to be thankful for those saints of old. For they, were for they were faithful during difficult times. And yet, we're the ones 
who have received a better blessing. They saw some of those blessings from afar, but we enjoy them today through Jesus Christ. If those saints of old hadn't trusted God and obeyed his will, Israel would have perished and the Messiah wouldn't have been born. Church, verse 6, again, says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. On the other hand, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says that this kind of faith grows as we listen to his word and fellowship in worship and prayer. My point being that faith is possible to all kinds of believers in all kinds of situations. It's not a luxury for just a few elite saints. It's a necessity for all of God's people. This again highlights the supreme significance of the new covenant. It was only in the establishment of the new covenant by the blood of Jesus that the old covenant promises could be fulfilled. And this is what the author meant in verse 40. It's, a, it's tempting, yes, I know because I've thought it before. It's tempting to think or even say, oh, to have seen the lion's mouth stopped, the parting of the Red Sea, or fire falling from heaven. Man, that would have been amazing to see. And my, I definitely would have faith. But in reality, truly, in all reality, we've experienced something far greater than any of those miracles. The Lord Jesus lives in our hearts. He lives in your heart. He walks with you every moment of every day. He gives you direction. Whenever we take time to just stop and listen. That, my friends, is greater, more spectacular, more miraculous than any Old Testament miracle that's mentioned that these Old Testament saints saw. Although we take all of these things for granted, any, any one of them would have astounded any one of, those old, any one of these Old Testament saints that was mentioned. The heroes of faith who preceded us didn't experience the perfection or the maturity we now enjoy in the new covenant. And so how do you receive this new covenant? By faith, saying, Lord, I too am looking for a better country. And by faith, I'll see greater things than even those heroes and heroines did because although they saw awesome th events externally, I've experienced your miraculous grace internally. The promise of your kingdom ultimately and the promise of your presence eternally. Let me sum up this last section that I read with four applications that you can take with you. Now, I cannot expand a lot on these because again, time, but I encourage you to think about how they apply more extensively to your life. First, faith is ready to sacrifice present comfort for future reward with Christ. Faith recognizes that this life is very short in comparison with eternity. With Paul, Faith recognized that the momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Now, in Paul's case, 
this light affliction included beatings, imprisonments, being stoned, shipwrecked, and often being in danger of death. And so my question now to you is, when you experience light affliction, what do you do? Do you grumble? Or do you do joyfully trust God? Second, faith lives with a Godward focus, not with a focus on people or things. Other, another way of putting it is faith lives with a vertical view, not a horizontal view of things. The saints mentioned in our text could endure mocking, scourging, imprisonments, and death because their focus was on God. Not on anything else. Not on their friends, not on their family, not on their wealth, not on their businesses. No, their focus was on God. And that's the only thing that got them through all those things. Calvin, John Calvin, put it this way. We ought to live only so as to live for God. As soon as we are not permitted to live to God, we ought willingly and not reluctantly to meet death. Third, faith trusts and obeys God, leaving the results to his sovereignty. Some trust and obey God, and he grants spectacular results. Maybe you've seen them before. Others trust and obey the same mighty God, and he enables them to endure horrific trials in his strength. We have brothers and sisters in Christ that are suffering, are going through some of these trials and persecutions and scourgings and beatings and marking and mocking and and death to this at this very moment in some parts of the world but they still continue to trust to trust and obey the same mighty god who for others have who others have seen him do some amazing, spectacular things. The difference isn't in the people or in their faith, but in God's sovereign purpose in each situation. We know the same God that these Old Testament saints knew, and we have even more in that we know, we now know Christ personally. So we should trust him as they did. We should trust God just as much as they did. We ought to have the same kind of faith they did. Whether he chooses to put us to death, as he did with the Apostle James, or to deliver us from death for a while, as he did with Peter. And fourth, faithfulness to Jesus counts more than anything else, even more than life itself. As Martin Luther put it in his book, or in his writing, A Mighty Fortress, let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abided still. His kingdom his kingdom is forever. So, my friends, trust God. Trust Him in whatever difficult situations you face. And some of you are dealing with some really hard situations. Trust Him. Put those situations in His hand. And just look to Him. Continue to walk 
with him. Continue to obey him. He will reward you. Maybe not now, right now at this very instant, but eventually he will. Maybe not in this lifetime, but in the next. So whether it's family issues, whether it's financial issues, whether it's health issues, don't let those circumstances bog you down. Don't let those circumstances be a, a foot on your neck. Look to the cross. Look to Jesus. He fought. He died for you. He delivered you. He loves you. And He has a reward waiting for you. Don't give up. No matter how hard it gets. No matter what difficult situations you face one day soon you will hear the words from jesus he said in matthew chapter 24 verse 21 well done good and faithful servant enter into the joy of your master friends as i close this chapter Here's what I hope that you've gotten from what we've covered here in chapter 11. All the faithful, all the faithful of all the ages are made perfect in Christ. All of them. We're all in it together. From Abel to Rahab. From Paul to Billy Graham. And yes, even to you. And the message to the embattled little church and to us is how great our advantage. Right here, while we walk on earth, we have the perfection of Christ. And it's so much better under this new covenant. We now have a high priest who has offered a perfect sacrifice for our sins, for your sins, once and for all. Our Savior, priest, sits at the right hand of the Father, prays for us, he intercedes for us. We have then, we truly have a better hope. How much easier it is for us to walk in faith even if the walk is down a shadowy road of neo-pagan culture, of such hatred towards Christianity, towards the church, towards Jesus. I've heard what some of those people have been protesting, some of those words that these pro-abortionists have been yelling about Jesus and about the church and about Christians. And it grieves my heart every time I hear them speak such blasphemous words. But I remember they don't know. They don't understand. They don't have the Spirit of God living in them. And so they're speaking of things that they don't know or understand. And even if they do and are speaking those words, man, they're bordering on the edge of grieving the Holy Spirit. They're trampling and the Word of God and they're nailing Jesus once again on the cross. I just, I, for me, I, it's unfathomable for a believer, for a Christian who, again, has walked with Christ to say, that abortion should be legalized. That abortion is the right thing. And it's a human right. That abortion is a human right. Again, we must continue to walk in faith as Christians. 
even as the world seems to be falling apart. As Christians, we're called to a dynamic certainty on the basis on nothing else but God's word. It's a future certainty that makes the future as if it were present. It's a visual certainty that brings the invisible into view. Church, it's survival of truth. As Christians, as believers, we mustn't succumb to the delusion that gentle rain and sunshine will continue to fall on the church in America as this culture continues to sink into neo-paganism, to this crazy form of liberalism, progressivism, Christian progressivism. We must understand that things are only going to get worse. And it's very important that during those times, even as it gets worse, how important it is to hold on to Jesus, hold on to the Lord, continue to meet together as believers, continue to invite others to come and hear God's word. We shouldn't be embarrassed of that. We shouldn't neglect that. Even your worst enemy, yes, you can invite to come to church. You, you may sit over there and they may sit over here, but hey, at least they're here and they're listening to God's word. And maybe, just maybe, one day there will be reconciliation. But again, we must understand that we, that it's always, not always going to be fine and dandy here in the church in America. It's foolish. It's egotistical. What hubris to imagine that the church will sail through the bloody seas that we will never have to experience the kind of persecution that the early church had faced or even some of these saints that we read about had faced. Had faced. One day, the Bible tells us and I, really, I, be, I truly believe this, that after we believers have been raptured, Christians will come to know, people will come to know the Lord. Those Christians that are living during the tribulation period, they're going to go through some crazy times. They're going to experience a lot, and some of them will be killed, and the Bible tells us in Revelation, some of the things that we'll have to go through. But yes, what I'm saying is that eventually it will be here. That persecution, again, will once again, once again plague the church. But you don't have to go through that. You can believe today. You can believe in Jesus. You can place your faith in Him. You can make Him your Lord and Savior and know for a fact that you won't have to go through that and you will be with the Lord when he comes for his church at the rapture. We have to read these words or look at these stories of these saints carefully. And have the same kind of faith as they had. And we must see what got them and learn what got them through those difficulties. Friends, this chapter has showed us so many things about faith, what it looks like, what it looks like and what it does. 
And so now, again, I come to you with a question. What kind of faith do you have? Do you have the faith like these men, like some of these women? Or do you have no faith at all? Let me tell you that today you can. You can put your faith and trust in Jesus and he will forgive you of all your sins. All you have to do is come to him at the cross and ask for forgiveness. Ask him to forgive you of all your sins and he will deliver you. He will set you free. The chains of sin and death will be broken. He will save you. So if that's what you'd like to do, if that's you now want to begin a life of faith, true faith, true biblical faith, I want to invite you to the cross. I want to lead you to a prayer to, in a prayer to b- believe in him, to trust in him. But you must do it with all sincerity. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. I want you to pray this with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I truly do believe that you died for my sins and that three days later you rose from the dead. I now repent of my sins and confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me whole and clean. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me, so that others may see you through me and glorify you. Use me in any way you want, Lord, to fulfill your glorious purpose, to fulfill your glorious plan. Here I am, Lord. Use me now. In your name. Amen. For those of you that are watching and listening to this later on, if you prayed that, please, 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 please get a hold of us. We want to know that you prayed that. We want to help you in your next steps of your Christian walk. If that's what you're looking for, I want to thank you for joining us as this week as we finish uh, this chapter, chapter 11. Next week, we'll be in chapter 12. We only have two more chapters left. So um, thank you so much. I have, hope you have a great week. Um, I hope you're blessed. I hope you um, will bless others. And I'm looking forward to, to being with you here next week. So we love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.